So hello everyone, I'm Scott Jackson. I am the Mary Irene Ryan Executive Director of Shakespeare at Notre Dame, as well as a co-founder of the Shakespeare in Prisons Network with Kurt Tofflin, who just jumped in here really quick. Um, oh, there's Lori Brooks coming in too. Uh, so welcome. This is our, our ninth installment of Anti-Racism in Practice. We started this in response to the murders of George Floyd and Maude Aubrey and countless others. Uh, over the course of last summer, and we've been meeting monthly um, since then. And so this is our, our ninth edition in this monthly series, which I can't quite believe because I don't think I've left my dining room table this whole time. Um, so a couple agreements here today. Uh, first off, I just want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the unceded lands of the Pokagon Band of the Potawatomi. Um, and I encourage you all, if, you, if you're so inclined, to include a land acknowledgement in the chat. Um, and here comes Michelle. Uh, and so, yep, what we're going to do, we've got a, a Q&A planned here for today, and Michelle's just coming in right now, and I'm going to introduce our guests in just a moment. Um, but just to let you know that uh, today is being recorded. If we go into a broader discussion, like breakouts or things like that, which I don't foresee us doing today, we will we'll pause that recording. Um, and then pick it back up when we come back into this main kind of plenary style here. Um, if you have a question for, for our contributors, please drop it into the chat whenever it strikes you. And as the conversation moves around, we will, um, we will try to get to your question. Um, so let me go ahead and um, introduce you to our guests today. Robbie Pollack and Michelle Jones are joining us. And I've got this queued up here. I just want to read through their bios because <clears throat> these are amazing people who are here with us today to talk about the politics of prison. So Michelle Daniel Jones is a fourth year doctoral student in the American Studies program at NYU. She's interested in excavating the collateral consequences of criminal convictions for people and families directly impacted by mass incarceration. Michelle's advocacy extends beyond the classroom through collaborations and opportunities to speak truth to power. Yes. While incarcerated, she presented legislative testimony on a reentry alternative she created that was approved by the Indiana State Interim Committee on the Criminal Code. As a subject matter expert, she serves in the development and operation of task forces, think tanks, and initiatives to reduce harm and end mass incarceration, and has joined the, bards, uh, the boards excuse me, of Worth Rises and the Correctional Association of New York and the advisory boards of the Jamie Sisterhood, J-A-M-I-I, -I, the Education, Jami. Jami, the Jami Sisterhood, the Education Trust, A Touch of Light, and the Urban Institute. She's also a founding member and board president of Constructing Our Future, a reentry and housing organization for women created by incarcerated women in Indiana and is a 2017-18 Beyond the Bards fellow. Beyond the Bars fellow. Why am I saying Bard every time? A 2017-18 research fellow at the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History at Harvard. A 2018-19 Ford Foundation Bearing Witness Fellow with Art for Justice. 2019 SOZE Right of Return Fellow, 2019 Code for America Fellow, and a 2019 2020 Mural Arts Fellow. I'm going to leave it right there because Michelle is decorated. Um, and then also with us is Robbie Pollack. And Robbie is, is uh, Penn America's Prison Writing Program Manager. And for over a decade, he's worked with the justice system and its intersection with the arts. He is an ongoing participant in rehabilitation, rehabilitation through the arts, Music Cambia, Hudson Link for Higher Education in Prison, and Carnegie Hall's Musical Connections Advisory Committee. He's collaborated with the Fortune Society, Osborne Association, and several New York City grassroots organizations. He's participated in workshops and panels at Columbia, Harvard, NYU, Yale, and other universities to advocate for the power of the arts in prison education and restorative justice practices. As a visual artist, he illustrated the picture book for children uh, for incarcerated parents, uh, Sing Sing Midnight, which is used in therapeutic settings around the country. And as a singer-songwriter, his compositions have been heard at the Obama White House, the RFK Human Rights Foundation, Create Justice Forums, the Vera Institute of Justice Gala, the New York Ethical Society, and Carnegie Hall. 
Uh, Robert is a fall 2019 New York Community Trust Leadership Fellow. So thank you both very much for joining us today. We're really honored to have you uh, for this conversation. And with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Kate Powers uh, to, to get us started. Welcome everyone and uh, welcome especially Michelle and Robbie. I'm thrilled that you are both here. Um, so uh, we um, wanted to talk a little bit to start um, uh, with the idea that, um, or the notion that you know, black people have been disproportionately impacted both by mass incarceration and by COVID-19, right? Um, and that more than 40 of the 50 largest cluster outbreaks in the country have occurred in jails and prisons. Uh, Prison Policy Initiative released a report in December detailing that over half a million cases of COVID-19 uh, in the summer of 2020, or roughly 13% of all the cases were attributable to mass incarceration. Uh, compared with the general population, the number of COVID cases in prison is 5.5 times higher. Uh, underlying medical conditions place incarcerated populations at elevated risk for COVID, uh, COVID-related morbidity and mortality. Um, Older individuals over the age of, <laughs> this pains me to say, over the age of 55 are at low risk for reincarceration, re but at high risk of severe complications and mortality due to COVID. Um, and transmission risks are further exacerbated in prisons and jails by the confined conditions, overcrowding, high occupant turnover, um, and a scarcity of resources. So I'm going to throw it to the two of you and ask you uh, if you would speak to uh, the conditions of confinement, um, to your experience maybe of medical care behind the walls. Um, and uh, Michelle, maybe you wanna also talk about impact on families. Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, thank you all for, um, hi Kurt. Uh, thank you all for inviting us here today. Um, the, because I'm in constant contact with women, some of my friends who are still in right now, I have multiple email addresses so no one can really track me. Um, I am hearing even more harrowing stories than originally that we started hearing in May. Um, basically, no, the women have not had any visitation, and this is kind of happening across the country with their families or their children since the onset of COVID. And so these are people who have not seen their parents, their moms, their aunties, their sisters um, for a year. Um, and when you add that into the conditions of confinement under COVID, um, the permanent or semi-permanent lockdown that um, fluctuates depending on the number of cases, um, it creates um, it creates a high pressure, high tense, high stress environment. Um, some of the things that I've seen done are, are quite horrific, frankly to the point where staff and custody are all suffering along with this. And I know you've heard this story that, you know, when, when you incarcerate people, everyone in that family is incarcerated, but there, there are staff who also in custody are also in a, a state of incarceration to the point where uh, in one in particular harrowing incident, um, instead of s sending themselves to a, a particular area on the housing unit to calm down a woman who was basically freaking out, the pressures under COVID, the isolation, um, the lack of resources, the lack of mental health care concerns that are happening for a population suffering under this under these conditional confinement. She basically had like a, a, an anxiety manic episode and they sent in incarcerated women to go calm her down instead of trying to handle the situation themselves. Unfortunately, one of my friends ended up co uh, with COVID in this incident of going to the COVID unit to calm another woman down. And at first I was really excited that they were seeing the women as leaders who could go and be ambassadors and, and can um, you know, kind of keep the temperature down. But I realized that through further thinking about it, they were literally putting the risk, the health of the incarcerated women at risk over themselves. And um, the women did not have the choice whether or not to go because they were, that was part of their job. They used the people who are sitting on suicide watch to be redeployed on COVID units. Um, uh, and so when you add that in with the loss of programming, the lack that the, the reality that higher education programming has either completely um, uh, ended or has uh, turned completely uh, correspondence, uh, you have a situation that 
I know people were talking about how stir crazy they were under quarantine. Imagine that under the conditions of confinement. And so what I'm learning from some of my friends, I mean, and I have never been under the long permanent, semi-permanent lockdown that they have been under the months. We have had, we have had, you know, um, small cases of like, uh, lice and different things like this, where we've had quarantine, nothing like of the level of which these women are currently under. Um, and art is one of the only escapes for them under the, under the condition, under those conditions. And so I just wanted you to think about like the holistic experience of what's happening on the house and units. Um, and then also in our, in our facility in the state of Indiana, they were locking the women in, in facilities that were too old to have ventilations in the rooms. So these were old antiquated rooms that they were being locked in without ventilation, without toilets in the rooms for 18 hour plus days. And, and it's almost like, well, no, it's not almost, it's in fact, we are punishing you for the reality that we are dealing with a pandemic. And uh, <laughs> it is an ongoing struggle. We have launched several campaigns in our state, the state of Indiana, to get the governor to move. We have pressured the uh, commissioner. We have gotten one uh, lieutenant, su assistant superintendent fired for their con for, for creating um inhumane living conditions, uh, but there's so much work to do. And, um, but I want you to kind of like think about it as if you had to live in your closet for six months and what that would be like for you without a toilet, without ventilation, and you didn't have access to the programming and the opportunities that like lighten your load as a person that like makes you you're able to breathe in an environment. That's what it's like. Uh, currently in the COVID, uh, I, I am I am encouraged by uh, some movement I've seen where uh, additional fans have been added to housing units and, and anything that I can improve the uh, living conditions. Some facilities are allowing um, for uh, like uh, there are some some facilities are allowing for um, this idea of, of this allowing secure tablets and Chromebooks and things like that to come in to offer some for some engagement. Um, but it's also a worry that particularly in higher education programs, that how can you provide quality programming on tablets and Chromebooks? And can you even claim that you're providing quality, pro quality programming and student engagement um, uh, with a computer, right? But in lieu of nothing, I say, give people what they need uh, to survive living in a closet. And I'll pass to Robbie. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. I mean, that paints a really dire picture. Thank you, Scott and Kate and, and everyone for being here. I guess it's, it's. I'm really glad, Kate, that you centered the discussion about COVID in prisons. It would be like really weird to talk about, um, you know, anti-racism and art in the prison context without facing the dire situation that's inside. And to be quite frank, uh, almost everyone I talk to has reached a fatigue point out here thinking about the condition of prisons. It's, uh, first of all, prison is forgettable. We're not there. Um, we don't see it. Even to get access as people who have volunteered in a prison setting knows is, is it's a rare and you, you may or may not pass the buck. You may or may not find an organization that you can work with to get inside prison. Um, and so we don't, we don't know. Uh, so we have like a vague notion of like discomfort and privation and isolation that people might experience, but it's very hard to hold on to the actual reality of what pervasive, endless lockdown looks like. Um, and so I, maybe I want, I think I want to like just reframe prison a little bit. Um, a lot of people have an idea of prison often that um, it's about living in a cage and, you know, going to the mess hall and like maybe trying not to get stabbed in the yard, um, with some higher education and maybe arts programming thrown in, um, it, it, from the kind of things that we see maybe in documentaries. And like, 
it's some of the story, but the reality is my friend uh, and, and fellow actor RTA alumni Kenyatta always says is that prison is just an extension of the outside world. So inside prison, there are communities and friendships and organizations and life and like really there, it's all that life is based around movement that happens in normal times because I may have access to the 30, 50 people in my pod or unit or cell block or whatever. But when we go out to programs, when we go out to the yard, when we go to religious services, we get to mix and intermingle and have kind of a semblance of communal life inside. And we do that in artistic ways, do that in creative ways, do that in social ways. And so for the last year, basically, all social uh, safety valves have been closed. And um, I can recall several week long lockdowns um, at Sing Sing. And uh, recently, uh, Rehabilitation to the Arts received some letters from participants of the program from the inside. And they pieced together a piece called Lulu, um, I Hear You. Uh, which is available on the web. Maybe the links will go flying in the in the chat. Uh, but as part of this piece, um, it describes the increased tensions on one housing unit where a guy is trying to get a cassette player so he can play the tapes sent in by the organization or the outside. Um, and it, I was worried when we performed this uh, play whether it captured the way it feels to not have any of those safety valves opened. Um, here in my neighborhood in Queens, uh, during the pandemic, I remember coming outside of my house and seeing my neighbor across the street and we had a chance to kind of talk from across the street. And uh, it felt really good that those little moments of like neighborliness um, and I think about how much of that is not happening on the inside and just how, how it's impacting the prison economy, which is a real thing. Um, Michelle uh, is on the board of Worth Rises that looks at um, the economics of the prison industrial complex and exactly what who's benefiting from keeping the system doing exactly what it's doing super cool organization. Uh, I really dig it. What we often don't talk about as well is the fact that all the black and brown people and poor white people inside prisons um, are being subsidized by poor black, brown, and white people on the outside, by the families that are bearing the... If you haven't burnt all of your bridges and you're in prison, you are being upheld and supported by poor people who can't afford it. So they're paying for your exorbitant prices for phone calls, for food to supplement the food that you're not getting and can't survive on, which also contributes to this underlying health conditions thing. And now I'm ranting. So I feel, I feel like I've slipped over into the rant side. Um, bear with me, but thank you. Um, and what happens inside the prison is, again, we don't look at the internal economy of what it means. So I... I knew guys who wrote cards for a living to, and people would send cards with poems, maybe not Shakespearean sonnet style, but poems on the inside, Hallmark worthy probably with custom designs. And they would send that to the family as an encouragement for the family to come see them. And then all of these, all of these minute interchanges of art and value and uh, stamps and cigarettes and all the stuff that makes prison function has now ground to a complete halt, making whatever uh, breeding ground for violence and 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 harm and pain even more um, heightened in in this period. With that said, much like Michelle mentioned, I have a writer who we work with who also uh, did an illustration around the beginning of the pandemic, uh, a series of illustrations describing how they heard about the pandemic and what disinformation was floating around. Uh, maybe we can, I'll find a link and drop it in a little bit later. Um, 
but his name is Jeremy and Jeremy is in Attica Correctional Facility and he was talking about how he is on the suicide prevention watch and they, like Michelle has stated, are being called into duty to do all kinds of things that are just like absolutely beyond the pale of, of what they're being paid for at 18 cents an hour, up to 25 cents an hour. Um, much like the people who were called to fight wildfires during a pandemic in California. Um, and uh, one thing that we didn't mention as well is uh, that I just want to throw into the end of my rant is the one of the most challenging pieces I noticed from the outside after hearing from hundreds and hundreds of people who have experienced COVID on the inside is the fact that being transparent will cost you. So uh, scores of men and women that write us have told us that they, if they experience any symptoms, the first primary urge is to hide the symptoms because the penalty for discussing your symptoms includes being put in solitary confinement and isolation, which is also unsafe. So you may be placed in a solitary confinement and isolation cell in proximity to other people who are also COVID uh, positive. You may not even be positive and you be, will be placed in a position where you're almost guaranteed to contract the virus um, as a result of you experiencing or saying that you're experiencing a system. So what that creates is obviously an environment where people are sick, coughing, mistrustful, distrustful of everyone around them. If you like look like you might have a fever or you're a little bit flushed or you're uh, not feeling well, it it's impossible to, to like describe a situation in which you can't even seek help or you can't take care of the people around you well enough. So I've seen people, it's just a horrible situation to be in emotionally, to not be able to keep yourself safe, anyone else around you safe. And at best you'll be put in isolation where you're almost guaranteed to catch the, uh, the virus. Um, and I, I guess one more final addendum is that we saw an uptick in uh, states releasing people from custody and sort of lowering the um, jail detention rates. Uh, so in California, they let like 16% go early on and like 35% of the people were released and they're looking at getting out people as much as they can, but then we saw that sort of taper off toward the mid to the end of the summer to a point where now we're almost back to incarcerating people in detention at the same rate that we were before the pandemic. Um, and releases aren't happening with the same frequency. So decarceration as a step to preventing the spread of this disease behind bars has not is, is not happening. Um, it's basically trickled down to, to a halt. And I guess that's the last thing I'll throw out. But I'll, I'll add one thing to that. Um, and, um, and one of the reasons of that, right, it makes sense. Would it be hugely detrimental to a family that has been harmed if someone was down to their last 365 days and you release them a little bit early for, uh, no, because they can't, nothing will, nothing will repair that harm. Releasing them 30, 365 days early or releasing them 365 days, like that person is still deal will still be dealing with the harm. So that arbitrary number that we were fighting for um, uh, is not the reason why they didn't say no. When we were fighting for the people who were chronically ill, who were 70 plus years old, who had all of the pre uh, of the, um, the the conditions that were highly likely to to for those people to contact contract COVID, they didn't want to let those people go as well. So so. It's not about the fact that there was pre-existing conditions or the fact that people were down to 365 days or less and they didn't want to release them. It's more, of, and, 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 and that somehow it would be unjust to release these people. It gets more back to this question that we've been talking, uh, talking about is that they didn't want to release people uh, because of the racial underpinnings of who might be released. Because it makes no sense. If you had, if you were going to get out 365 days now, 
or 306 now or 365 days later. Nothing changes for the individual that is in harm. So it wasn't about that. If someone is 60, 70, 80 years old, dying in prison, and we want to release this human being because they are more susceptible to COVID, right? Uh, the reason why you won't release them has nothing to do with the fact of their age, right? And, and, and so the whole question of decarceration under COVID, right? The, the people, even Cuomo, who said he was going to decarcerate, it was all a freaking smokescreen because they didn't really want a slew or a large population of black and brown people, so-called getting out, getting free. But you would rather keep prisons compacted. Almost every prison is overcrowded. You'd rather create the amount of, increase, multiply exponentially the number of people who could become contracted with COVID versus decarcerating some of that population so that you can spread the remaining population out and get to some sort of semblance of social distancing. They, they, they didn't want to do that. And, and why? I believe it comes back to race. I think, I believe it comes back to race and and the and the and the stamp of the taint of criminality that exists upon pop people who come in the criminal justice system. We are forever a criminal, and they weren't going to let out all of those black and brown people. Um, and those people who did decarcerate, there were very few. If they said they were going to uh, pop, let go so many, they only let go a tiny portion. Um, and I just find I, 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 no one has talked about the reasons why they did not decarcerate. And it's not because they had the ability to provide proper PPE, proper social distancing, or the ability to quarantine. This was about a whole other reasons why they refused to let people go. Even as, even as the heat increased, even as the population increased, even as they refused, the, even while they were con continue to fill prisons and jails with people for technical violations. So it, it's, it's been a really rough year just dealing with that. Um, those aspects on the ground. Michelle, what you're saying is, I'm sorry, I'm bouncing. Uh, jump in, Kate. Does, does, you, you do not have to like stay silent with, amid- You're right, good, oh, Robbie, oh, off you go. Conflagration. But I feel, feel like we're obviously entering this space uh, when we look, step back and look at, you know, race in America um, and what it means to, as Gloria Brown Marshall, playwright, author, uh, social justice legal champion um, and member of Penn's prison writing committee. She said, you know, that like many people said, uh, we're facing two pandemics, that of institutionalized racism and COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, you know, they interplay in this space. What's really interesting is I, I got to see an, uh, an opera based on, uh, Fidelio and it blew my I, brain yeah like yeah I, I know that piece from heartbeat it, opera right yeah yeah I worked on that project I mean I was in tears watching this thing it's got a clip of of an aria from Malcolm X it's um tremendously powerful but one of the things that really struck me there's a, a black woman who's a dancer and it's featured prominently in the opera and she's out in public and there's two black men dancing kind of like on the steps of what looks like Lincoln Center um, to me in, in New York City. And as they dance, one guy is a crump dancer and he's like really got the, the vibe and, and the juxtaposition of their bodies, the idea of what it means to be free as a black person in America bear my chest to the sun. <laughs> I think about in the context of my fear for all of the people I watched doing this, these performances in public. So as I'm watching the dancer, I'm like, don't get arrested, don't get shot. Do you have permits to be where you are? Mm -hmm. are, are you going to be physically okay Bearing your chest in the sun and being a person in space in the real world, and I'm not everybody who sees this art or this expression of art feels or thinks the same thoughts. To bring this full circle, 
I feel like it's a byproduct, obviously, of, of my particular trauma, my own sensation of my lack of freedom in public space. If I were to go to Jamaica Avenue, where I live, uh, stand on the street corner and recite some Shakespeare, I have to face the possibility of being arrested, and in my case, being on parole, going back to jail and dying from COVID for reading some lines of Shakespeare on the street. And that reality is a, is a, is a very striking one. Um, so I, to me, you can't separate art, the suppression of the ability to create, live and share art culturally from the prison industrial complex and all the systems that support and underpin it and keep it operating the way it does right now. Um, the black body has always made sense to cage, transfer, move, control. Um, and we are deadly afraid of black bodies in space. I feel uh, some of this feels like so much of a no brainer for me to say that I, I almost feel bad saying the words. Like it, it, does, it feels stupid to say, um, because I know, I know that from a kid, I've had the dream of riding my bicycle across country. I've written like seven songs about this concept of riding my bicycle across country. Um, and I, despite all of my white friends telling me, oh, there's nothing to be afraid of in Wichita, which podunk, which whatever. Um, I watch people who look like me get killed for no reason all over this country all the time. Where are you going, boy? Where are you coming from? Where? And if I run, that's an admission of guilt. If we'll, Or we'll sort it out in the courtroom, which is patently, provenly unfair and unjust. So I could be living with a life sentence in Angola for riding my bicycle across country. And yeah, maybe Brian Stevenson will take my case and I'll get off in, you know, 50 years or so after I'm too old to freaking do anything about it. Um, and the other thing, I guess, that I'll include into this rant is the idea of uh, criminality, which Michelle kind of brought up earlier. And I think to bring Shakespeare back into this, <laughs> one of the interesting things, Kate Powers uh, and Kate Kenny, who's on, on this call, uh, brought a lot of Shakespeare into the prison where I was. And it wasn't my first introduction to Shakespeare, but I certainly had never dived into Shakespearean text or appreciated it for what it was before. Um, but one of the things that struck me was, you know, the characters that are in the play and how how we could celebrate an Iago or how a flawed Hamlet makes sense or even like a King Lear, how characters have this duality of like really noble and trying good and also have like the really bad things. I'm, I am not a Shakespearean expert. Do not shoot me. Stop looking so keenly at me. Kenny, um, I was listening in class. Now, anyway, uh, but the, the point is that our ideas for white uh, fallibility in, in the largest sense, this is not an indictment of white people, uh, period, but our images are, are readily, heuristically acceptable images of white fallibility is that if someone did something wrong, oh, they're an exception, they're a serial killer, they're, they're an evil person, they're a twisted, warped individual. Um, and then for black thug kid, it's like a, in a blanket, they're dangerous. And, and they, these generalities are literally drilled into us by all of our media that we digest and generations of, of, of stories that we tell. Um, so one of the beautiful things I think about Shakespeare is realizing that um, I, I personally don't have to internalize the negative narratives that exist about me in the world. As a Black man, I can be as free as a Shakespearean character. <laughs> I can live in a space that says I have ugly and there may be redemption for me and there may not. And I may alternate between good and bad and like make awful choices, but I exist in a, a world larger than the narratives that are written for me um, by society. And I, I, I recall a lot of people experiencing that. So like not in words, 
But if you were to ask me, and Kate didn't ask me, but yet, but if you were to ask me, what's the value of narrative, both internally in terms of the person, and then the weird thing when we put a black person in a Shakespearean role and then put them on stage. So like, oh, we make an all black cast of, I don't know, or all woman cast of some Shakespeare, right? What is the value of that? I think what it does is we know it pushes up against our, who we think has the right to be full humans mm -hmm. uh, with good and bad and ugly without being blanket labeled. Um, mm -hmm. I'm interested in your thoughts, Michelle. I see you nodding a little. I'm hoping mm -hmm. you can salvage my rant. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I totally, I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, I think um, we can bring this to the uh, to discussion about death. I think about um, how death of incarcerated people go unremarked and un, unacknowledged and um, uh, and and un, unknown. You just someone dies, and that's the end of it. Um, and I and I love uh, there were several point, points that I, I love that you talk about that you overlap and and so one of the cathartic more um, activists me being an agent um, and 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 owning uh, the right to call these people's names is is this participation in this group that we call Mourning Our Losses and Mourning Our Losses is a website that and we've done several memorial services where we honor the names of everyone who's died under COVID, um, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. But, but it's even more than that. We have incarcerated people who knew them to write their memorials. We have people who knew what their faces looked like to draw their pictures that will go on the site. We have people who, we, we take pieces of their poetry and their artistry and we say, this is who this person is. We refuse to let this person die in absentia without remarking who they are, their whole personhood and their worth. And so memorial, uh, mourning our losses is one of the ways in which, as we talk about all the ugly of the conditions of confinement that we're up against, the work that we're doing and mourning our losses is one of the ways in which I get free. I, I'm able to lift up um, these human beings um, across the country. Um, I, I was actually able to memorialize one of the women that I actually worked with who, you know, her death kind of shook me to my core because she wasn't elderly. She wasn't obese. She wasn't one of those people who said, oh, you're so susceptible to COVID. Um, and she's some beautiful daughters and she's no longer here. Um, and I had to find some way to deal with that and not let her death just be a death that's gone. I had, we had to, we had to acknowledge the full personhood and push past the idea that the criminal doesn't get to be remembered. It doesn't get to be thought of. And so what I appreciate, um, and you guys can take a look at morningourlosses.org and, and see the work that we've done. But I love how people have chosen to express the essence of that person through the art, through the drawings, through the poetry, through the essay, through the pieces of the human, through the photos, the photos that were chosen, um, through, the, through, the, through the notion that and you, I will never, we will never let these people just be that criminalized body. That body that you know that you know Rob was talking about. Robbie was talking about that's targeted for incarceration, targeted for death. And though they have died, we refuse it. It is our refusal of that. And I think that the work that the faculty do um, on the ground with students inside is is also saying I. It is an act of refusing the tag of criminality, the ongoing taint of criminality and reclaiming the individual um, to, towards a path of wholeness. And it's not instant. As people, you know, everywhere, we, we sometimes fight against our, um, our, 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 own, our own liberation. Um, and so those people who can push past that um, get free. And I think that's important. And I think what we do with our art, what we do with our creative expression 
because I have, I mean, I have a liberation, a, a, a black liberation theology. And uh, I think it is all towards getting free and be it even unto death. Damn, Michelle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel, I feel fear even as you say that. Yeah. And, and that's the reason why you need multiple emails. Um, exactly. I do. I have multiple emails. Yeah. yeah, no, no, yeah. I, I feel yeah. you. I feel you. Um, Cause I'm not going to lose contact with my people. I, I, I talk about my dad often. My dad is white. He's a Republican. He lives in semi-rural Pennsylvania and attended the Trump rally on the 6th. Did not go all the way to the Capitol, so I guess he's not an insurrectionist. Um, and, you didn't talk about this on the planning. Oh call. no, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, right yeah. Now. No, it's uh, really interesting. Um, and so, I I do want to talk about uh, white fatigue. This is your what call? How many How many of these anti-racism calls have you had? Like 800, 75? Nine. Nine. God, <laughs> Nine. like applaud y'all for sticking through this, through the, I mean, through a year where it's just like death, gloom, horror, insurrection, white supremacy, racism. And I've even seen, you know, the great writer Walter Mosley is like, all right, maybe let's change the words, uh, defund the police. And I love Walter Mosley. He's like, let's use words that don't force people into a corner. Like, and listen, I know all kinds of activists that are like, call it what it is, white supremacy, pin those motherfuckers to the wall, pin them to the wall with their own thing. And like, if, if you don't like how it feels getting pinned to the wall, then you are racist right this is how this is how we do it's like um but i'm i'm a big fan of when i look at art and i feel like i'm gonna i'm i'm kind of i'm peddling shakespeare a little bit but only because it it serves as a really good lens for how story can bypass people's defenses if I tell a woman you're racist, our conversation is over. Now we're arguing about whether you're racist or not. Um, I watched misunderstanding after misunderstanding get conflated with the, the underpinnings that can't change. Uh, a woman bumps another woman as they exit a doorway. They go back to the car. Next thing you know, they're harassing the lady in the car and the car lady in the car pulls out a gun and points it at the people point blank. And now we've had a whole escalation of a scene. Is it racism or is it just antagonism? Is it racism absolutely a part of it? What do we understand from this scenario? What's the human essence happening in this thing? And I think for me in my work, I have been very consciously crafting work that highlights the humanity even inherent in raging racists um and the humanity inherent in well-meaning white people who think they aren't racists and the humanity inherent in me who's a man full of toxic masculinity and a past that is ugly right so if i <laughs> if i want forgiveness for me then I was telling Kate right before we hopped on this thing, I need liberal dollops of compassion all over everybody. And I think when I look from a, a perspective of the dramatic arts, one of the things I remember, Kate, and you, this is not just to praise you, just to be very clear. One of the things that you brought in every, every time we did a scene was, where is the love? in this scene was something you so you're asking guys in prison right we're looking at another dude maybe he wants to beat me up after we step out of this room but i have to look at him spitting in my face in pre-covid times as we do this scene and say where is the love in the scene and what's keeping me right here what's keeping me from walking away from this asshole his character is an asshole 
the improv that he's playing right now is an asshole. So like, why would I stay and engage with this asshole? And I think that question is so fundamental to understanding the divisions that we're facing now and how we move past it. What keeps us in this American experiment? What keeps us from not just walking outside and blowing everything up? Um, and I think those are really interesting questions to me. They're really interesting questions through the lens of art and, and the work we create and the, the words we use. Um, if I'm just pointing at you and telling you you're an asshole, I'm not sure how good, how much that drives the scene forward, I guess. Michelle, I, I'm interested in this. We might see this differently because I know a lot of, act. there is a place for people who are like, look, this is what it is, but um, mm -hmm. I think there's I think there's a way to do this. I, I I think there's a way to do this in love. I'm from Indiana, and in my facility, um, the majority of the people who were incarcerated with me were white. Um, in the state of Indiana, had uh, like 68 percent of white women in the facility at the time. Um, all and and all of the staff, all the custody officers were black. A majority were black. Um, and so the, the standard viewing of what uh, a carceral environment looks like uh, on a national level was completely reversed in my facility. And so we had, to, we looked, I looked at everything differently. I looked at everything differently because the so-called oppressors and the so-called assholes looked like me, <laughs> right? And so I couldn't, I couldn't do, I couldn't organize, I couldn't facilitate through a holistically uh, racial uh, hard line, like all the black people we're going to organize to get, the, 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 it doesn't work like that. That's not reality because I know through my own research in the history project in, this, in the state of Indiana, I'm, I'm currently writing a book with uh, seven other incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women on the, uh, on the origins of the women's carceral institutions in the state of Indiana. And what we found is, is that when white women enter prisons, they lose white, they lose the high level white privilege. Um, the taint of criminality dilutes their privilege. And so what I saw was a slew of white women being treated just as bad and shitty as I was, right? And so we, there was a leveling of the playing field. It, it, their, their experience wasn't exactly like mine. It was different than mine, but we were both under the same tank of criminality. And you definitely saw a loss of privilege. So I can't look, I can't organize against the conditions of confinement and leave out the white people. I mean, it, it, it makes sense, right? It doesn't make sense in that way. And so again, as I organize today um, on our COVID-19 task force, um, it's all of us, all hands on deck. Everybody who cares about an issue, who's willing to invest in an issue. Have I had to do some political education? Have I had to share some texts? Have I had to share some film? Have I had to convince people that their particular understandings um, were flawed because that wasn't coming from their lived experience? Absolutely. But because I care enough about the work, I'm willing to do that, do that political education and sharing without a, a spirit of um, a, a brace of conflict, because ultimately we, I need those people and they need me. Um, I bring something with my lived experience as a, uh, as a black woman of color growing up in the hood in Indianapolis, and they bring something from their perspective as white women and white men from their lived experience uh, coming from where they come from. And so I, I don't, ever orient myself that this is a, 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 an only a, a and or type of situation. I'm a both and. I need all hands on deck because what we are facing is what I call the tentacled arms of the carceral state. And which means it will reach out and grab the affluent, the, uh, the affluent white woman who uh, embezzles and frauds and brings her in, and she gets smack dab into the same prison I am and I come from where I come from both of us are going through shitty experiences under the yoke of incarceration and so I, I don't have any room for that um, but I do have to be willing to do the work for example I recently suggested my entire board 
I'm a board president of Constructing Our Future, go through the prison and mass incarceration curriculum that Worth Rises has freely available right now that it's offering free. Because I feel like um, while I'm studying this stuff, I am working from a set of understandings. I want us all to operate from the same space, the same set of facts. I don't believe, you know, fake news, my ass. There are certain things that are true, period, dot, <laughs> and, and about our conditions. And so we all need to be, we need to be willing to read, learn, educate, receive the political education so we can mobilize against it. I think that once people recognize that we really truly are in this together, my quality of living under the conditions of five-minute incarceration affects the girl next to me, affects the girl next to me, affects, me, affect, affects us all. Um, and I think that even as we organize now, we need to be working from a, a, a shared set of values. This is all about values. How do you believe that an incarcerated person is entitled to a personhood? Do you believe that that person is worth more than the idea of a criminal? Do you believe they should be act, receive access to resources and opportunity post-incarceration? What should their lived experience be like? How, what should they have access to? There are people who don't believe that incarcerated people should have access to a higher education while incarcerated. We need to eval, evaluate that. It's a value judgment. Um, and, and, and if we're going to organize to change conditions, we need to be operating from the same set of values. I don't want to interrupt because the two of you are on fire and this is awesome. Um, but I have a couple questions that I want to get to and then I want to be able to throw it open so that um, folks can either throw questions in the chat or um, enter into the conversation as well. Um, this is uh, so great, both of you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your perspective on this. And Michelle, I want to read that book if you need like a copy editor or a proofer. <laughs> I'm yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about it. We are in copy edits. Uh, it's with the new press and um, don't remind me about it. I got a due date. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this will be our first real published book and um, totally collaborative. And um, we would not have been able to pull this off had we not had faith in our faculty and our faculty had faith in us. That's great. A faculty in our lens in which we chose to view the archive. It wasn't a standard lens. I'm developing an entire, I'm writing the methodology that reflects the work that we did. Um, and that comes from trust, building that trust in the classroom, building that trust amongst faculty and students. So, so that the way we're viewing the, lens, the, the archive, you just so suppress and say, well, that's not how I learned it at Yale. So this is not how we're gonna let you do this in this classroom. Being willing to, being willing to recognize that how people understand a topic is directly related, directly related to their lived experience, and so that lens has value, and it's up to the faculty. Like you know, in our situation, our faculty was willing to respect our value, our lens, and, and create a new pedagogy with you. Yeah, and we did, yeah. and and yeah, so. Sorry. No, you're good. You're good. Um, I would love to ask, actually, apropos of faculty or of facilitators, I would love uh, to ask you both to talk to kind of a pair of questions around, um, first of all, the fact that the plurality of prison performing arts facilitators and faculty uh, are white folks and uh, how that was for you, what concerns maybe you have about savior or helper culture. Um, and then sort of next door to that, uh, what do we as white facilitators who really wanna support and be of, of service, what don't we know that we need to know? I'll be brief and I'll go first if that's okay with you, mm -hmm. Michelle. Um, there aren't a lot of really good books about um, trauma-informed facilitation, teaching artistry, like there are very few resources or guides that you can go to, especially working across um, cultural differences. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with maybe hundreds of white people who I completely didn't understand when I was inside prison. I could not 
understand the altruistic underpinnings of do-gooderism. Um, and I was constantly looking for the angle, like, what are you getting out of this? And if you don't clearly know what you're getting out of this, then how the hell can I trust you? Because I really don't believe in any unbridled altruism. So um, I think the first thing I would say is like, for people who work with any population other than you know, your own, really, really just be very clear with yourself about what the hell you're getting out of it. Um, and it's, it's, it's not always pretty. And so that's number one. Um, and I, I have to face that myself too. If I wanna like, I'm walking for kids with leukemia or doing the polar bear plunge, which I did last year for the first time ever, and it's cold. Um, I have to really question what the hell am I doing and why am I doing this? It gave me a feeling of legitimacy after years of incarceration that I could have a badge of honor that said, I'm doing something positive for society. Also, it felt good to do. So there's that too. Um, and then the other thing is, no, I'll leave it there. I'll let Michelle answer since we're running long. Yeah, no, I, I, I Can I jump in real quick? I'm sorry, Michelle. I just want to respond real quick to what Robbie said and then pass it to you. Um, I think this is so important, this thing of being really uh, honest and authentic with yourself about what your agenda is as a facilitator. Um, I know, uh, you know, when I went in, I thought it was all altruism for me. And one of the things that I discovered is, uh, you know, my, my uh, family of origin is a really complicated place where I didn't always feel welcome. But when I walked into that schoolhouse, I had 25 brothers who were really happy to see me. And that was, it took me a little while to figure out that that was part of what I was getting out of the work that I was doing, but it's, and it's not why I thought I showed up in the first place, but it's true. Sorry, I just wanted to. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I think that's actually, I, I agree with everything. And I think there's also this idea that um, I'm going to be the first to get this accomplished in this place or do this new program in this place. And so there's a status associated with being first and being new uh, to, uh, um, in a space um, that we have to be thinking of, like in terms of motive you, when you're assessing that. And also people who give access to people who can come into prison are often white people giving access to other white people um, in, in standard correctional settings. And so they tend to give more, they tend to get more access um, because they're given more access by people who look like them. Um, and so what I would say in response to that um, is that demand the inclusion of people of color and, and people with lived experience a part of your team. Um, include them. And if they say, well, that person of color has a, a criminal record, then ag agree to some other connection or other person or uh, agree to certain stipulations around that or push back against it. Um, I am a person that believes that the fact that someone has criminal justice, criminal, cr criminal legal system involvement should not mean that they should end all opportunity in their life to do anything else outside of that. And so it would take the people with access, the people with access to resources and opportunity to demand that they bring alongside people who have that lived experience and push back. If you've got everybody wanting to bring in a program in a department of corrections, in a facility saying, hey, we're pushing back. Suddenly the Department of Correction will come to the table and let me tell you why, because they use you all to supplement staff. You will all become supplementary staff to fill in the spaces where they can't keep people employed to watch incarcerated people. So if you are all organized and you say, hey, we need to change the rules of engagement I promise you they will come to the table because they need you, point blank. They need you. Um, also, think of shared power and control the, in, in the sense of this. One of the things I appreciate, appreciate about Dr. Kaufman is that 
great faculty wanted to come in and teach, but they also wanted to come in and teach and research us. And they wanted to come in and study, or they wanted to come in and, you know, write an article about them so they could get a little, you know, something for themselves on the side. She said that the only, the only consideration she would make is if you were co-authoring with the incarcerated woman, you are not going to come into the facility and be extracted. It should be all value added. Obviously, you're going to get some good feelings from it and this, that, 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 but in terms of literally taking from the population in terms of research, or in terms of, of their social capital, and then you're taking it and you're, you're um, uh, elevating yourself off of it, it, it you, you, that's something that needs to be uh, a, a question. So the orientation that you have to the student, is the student equal? Is the student one that if you were writing with a colleague at the university, would you simply say, you know, I'll just take what you wrote and then add it in with what I'm saying. And then we'll, I'll just, you know, and I'll, and give, you'll take the credit for that. St uh, the orientation that you have towards the student should be of colleague, student, student, teacher. But when you start to collaborate and build together, you become colleagues. And if you are really about changing the conditions of confinement, you need to become co-conspirators. You need to be thinking like, how can I work within the confinements that I'm in to help provide places for those students to get free? How do we help them get free in this box and cage that they're in? That is bigger, that is more, it's a deeper commitment than allyship. It says that I have stakes in the game um, because I really care about the outcomes for the student at the level of colleague, at the level of person, at the level, at the same equal level as myself. So I think that that's what I would think about the savior culture. The savior culture has a tendency, obviously, to have the hierarchy of the benevolent white person who has come on high with this amazing program that they created at the kitchen table, and they're going to come into the prison and trickle it down and descend upon the incarcerated people, and they're all going to get on their knees, and they're going to put their hands in their prayer hands and say, thank you so much, right? <laughs> fight, fight, fight that hierarchical relationship by thinking of colleagues, by thinking of uh, co-conspirators by thinking of co-creators with one another. One of the best plays I ever wrote while I was incarcerated was a play that my uh, that our um, play director um, co-wrote with us. It's it was the funniest, best play out of all the plays we did inside, and we put on a full repertoire every year of of plays, Shakespeare and. <laughs> the Odyssey and the Wiz, and we did it all, right? But the one that rings in our head the most is the one that we created about uh, Liberty Comets presents the return of Earth Disturber. And Earth Disturber was a, a, a creature that lived in the ground. And as more toxic dis dissonance happened in the community, she, it would seep into the ground and bring her up. What, and she would come and reign with her minions and she had to fight against seven powerful women who were all come from the essence of the feminine. And we played all these characters. It was the best freaking play we've ever, we've ever wrote. I, and I've written other plays. It was that collaborative uh, juice um, of, of, of working as, uh, um, as uh, cre co-creators. And I think that that pumps up against the savior culture um, that top-down hierarchical relationship that is standard in most uh, <laughs> programs that are brought in, and even in the teacher-student relationship, there's ways to bump up against that. Um, an example is like if, if you came into facilities and because you know we're already dealing with the hierarchy of the carceral state and the carceral system, if you come in with the orientation that you're going to teach your courses, sort of like grad school does, when you come to grad school a faculty sits around a table. We're all adults, because you're talking about adult learners here. Incarcerated people are not children. And so you're all sitting around a table. If, you, if you, someone looked in a window, you wouldn't know who's the teacher, right? And in a graduate level course, a teacher, um, a student 
each student is signed a chapter for that week on the syllabus. And that student teaches the chapter to their other students and the, fa and the faculty member offers the nuggets of wisdom or helps steer the conversation or off offers poignant direction to questions to kind of move the class along. But she is not the top down student, oh, the benevolent teacher, and here's the lowly student. The way in which graduate school is taught is because it's recognizing a co-creatorship relationship of adult learners. Michelle, are you crying? I just had the thought of uh, having experienced higher education in prison. And uh, I just thought about really quickly, one of the ways that top-down uh, education often transpires we'll do like a reading and it'll be like all right everyone what do you hear about uh with that sentence um the work of adrian marie brown in emergent strategy anyone anyone what do you what do you think about and then like the guided list of like questions goal oriented in order to like follow the idea in the curriculum in their own brain watching that unravel in space and time as people get like irritated and then increasingly distant looks. Um, <laughs> I, um, I'm so glad I was telling Kate as well, and Michelle is like, I have fallen prey to all of the things that I, you are highlighting that white people do in these spaces. Uh, so we thought we were smart. There's a mental health unit on Sing Sing that they don't, the guys in the mental health unit in, in this cor maximum correctional facility don't get to go to regular programs. And so they get no programming other than what the kind of fake health board provides. So a bunch of guys who had been through arts and theater programming were like, oh, we can build a curriculum and we'll go over there and like, we'll do it with the guys in the mental health unit. And so I stole all the theater games I learned from Kate Kenny and Kate Powers and all the other facilitators, zip, zap, and zop, and like little, whatever, little improv. And I was a veteran, right? I had three years of this uh, theater games and workshops under my belt. Uh, and so we get over there and everything I'm doing is wrong. Nothing works at all. And I'm like, I'm having to confront and face my own ableism and ideas about mental health and like process what I'm doing and what I'm offering and what it means to have to like constantly reevaluate my approaches and tactics and framing and all of that. And what my position of power, I'm able to walk into the mental health unit mm -hmm. and walk back out. They're stuck there. They mm -hmm. live there. Um, they're only able to go to the yard in isolation with their own groups. I get to go mingle with the whole population of, of 800 people from a block. They have a hundred people who they can get uh, hang out with. Um, we did a performance and it, the, the deputy of programs came down and watched this performance while we're, so we're singing Christmas songs. I don't really celebrate Christmas like hardcore. But like we're singing Christmas songs and it's really nice and every, it looks really good for the program, but the guys are kind of like tokenized and I'm watching them be tokenized as I've been tokenized, as I've performed on stage. It was such a learning experience for me going 360 into the role of facilitator inside a prison. It was mm -hmm. like the Russian doll thing, right? It was mm -hmm. like a big tick, tick, tick yeah. on, on all the levels. Um, and I think I say all that to say is that you are guaranteed to fail. Mm -hmm. You are white, you're going to a prison, you're already screwed up. There's no right way to do it. You're not gonna do it right. The whole system and structure is screwed up. It's like, oh, let me go swim with the sharks and I just wanna like get to know the sharks and, and, and like, ah, oh, I lost an arm. Yeah, you're swimming with sharks. There's no right way to do it. Or like, I don't know, that's a wrong metaphor. It's more like, um, I don't know. No, but I, I, we, I, I totally get your point. Um, I Thank think you. that I, I don't really get your point um, because it does take, it does take being in the shoes of instructor 
to kind of get that understanding of the challenge of being an instructor. And I think that um, students who get to step into that, even if for it's a chapter or even it's for one class um, or if it's for a section, um, is value life added experience. I, I know that I certainly learned a lot when I'm suddenly looking at my peers and I'm like, did you read chapter four? And, <laughs> and here we go, we're gonna talk about this. Um, or even, or even um, you know, I ran a liturgical praise dance group for 19 years. And can I say that I had the youthful uh, women, incarcerated women who were coming to prison at 15 and they were not feeling what I was cooking but I had to figure out as an instructor how to reach them so that they, um, they could uh, present whatever potential they wanted to share with us in the, in the group. And that meant being agile and being willing to reiterate and, and, and being able to change up and switch up. Did I lose some girls who were like, I can't handle no incarcerated woman telling me what to do? Yes, I did. But um, is the program still in existence right now? And it's and I've been out of incarceration three years and I ran it for 19 years while I was inside. Yes, it absolutely is because we created a foundation of peer led leadership um, and, and made it sustainable by being able to re, to to iterate, to change it up. Um, I think it's value added for to students to be in the spot of the teacher to learn. Um, as, as it all, as all of us was, when we are all, we've all been through academia and when we sat in the classrooms, we were like looking at the teachers, like, okay, whatever. And then suddenly we were in grad school and we had to teach a class. It was like, oh my God. Right. Um, so I, I, I think that where possible, um, uh, you're able to share that power and control. Um, I, I think it would be good for eliminating the savior culture um, uh, that currently kind of is kind of the way, um, you know, programming in prisons kind of operates. Hey, thank you. Um, might I steer the conversation just a little bit? Um, I'm, I'm, I'd really like to hear from your perspective, the dynamics of the room that we're walking into as facilitators, because sometimes, uh, based on loss of commissary privileges, whatever's happening within the facility that day. Um, as a facilitator, we walk into a room and there's a certain energy coming at us. And, and sometimes folks might um, uh, uh, hop to authoritarianism in, in auto, like an autocracy within the classroom based on something that is external and has nothing to do with the participants in the class, but that they're all suffering from that day. I'm wondering if there are any, you know, what are the dynamics that, that we as facilitators should be um, considering as we walk into a space and how that might ebb and flow day by day? I would say, question. I mean, there's a, there's a lot. There's just a lot because things pop off at any given time. Um, things pop off at any, I, I, I can just say, I can't reiterate that enough. I think that the more that you're consistent the better it is to shift once you come into the classroom, because the uh, the reality of, of living in prison is is the unpredictability. Um, you don't know what bunkie you're going to have. You don't know what CEO's gotten fired. You don't know. You know every time a new governor gets put in place, we get a new commissioner. A new commissioner has new plans for the prisons, and it trickles down to the superintendent doing business different. It trickles down to the major doing movement different. And, it, and, and so change is a constant animal. And one of the things that my, one of my faculty members used to do is kind of give us, once class started, like five, 10 minutes to like decompress. Like, okay, what is all of the shit that has happened prior to you being in this room? <laughs> okay, and people, whether people wanted to talk about it or not, whatever, sometimes it was a group thing. Sometimes some person would talk and speak for the whole group or whatever, um, but it was a way in which to, expel so that we could be present in the moment. I had another faculty member that did a breathing exercise. Uh, I had uh, another a faculty member that um, um, would like to bring in like um, brain teasers 
like on, you know, pieces of paper. Like you could sit down, like you're sitting there waiting for everybody to get here and you're looking at the brain teaser on the ground on the on the paper and you're like, okay, I'm gonna give my energy to this. I, I think all those things to kind of center the student into the classroom, I think is valuable. One of the things that I've done in my class that I taught, um, I, I created anthem dramas, um, is one of the things that I did is I had people stand up and uh, do something with their body because uh, I taught this class on Zoom and, <laughs> in the summer and most people have been sitting in Zoom world all day long and a chair and I was like, we need to see something from each person like out of the chair. And so I think because that comes from my experience of just being in a carceral space and, and having limited movement. And so I think any of those things um, to help decompress, decompress from the outside to the inside. I want to add one thing to that question, Scott. Thank you, Michelle. And um it is a lot. Like I, I was thinking about my situation in, in, in max facilities and like, um, I, I'm, I'm not saying this academically enough and I, I'm not even gonna try. There's a white woman in the room in the position of authority, usually in the case of most of the people who come in to teach are white women. In, in my experience in, in facilities. The, I don't, maybe it's biological, maybe it's whatever, but everyone wants the attention of this outside white woman. So like there's this factor there about how everybody in the room, it's, it's like built in. Um, and so if you're perceived as peddling for or trying to get attention too much it's like a bad look that's in the room before you even get in the room if you're a white guy and you're in the room and you're facilitating you are still the access point to the outside you are therefore the most important person in the room and so therefore if i come over to you and i ask you a question everyone else in the room is aware of me coming over to you to ask you a question about oh about that thing that uh, i said don't you see me? Don't you see how intelligent I am? Don't you see how different I am from everybody else? Uh, aren't I really your favorite? Uh, or you're noticing <laughs> me for five minutes right now. And therefore I have increased my status just a little bit. Um, there's that aspect. There's another aspect of the internal prison pecking order, which exists. Like we all know who did what. We all know who's a snitch. We all know who's accused of being and might be a snitch, who talks to cops for too long, who's a suck up, who gets visits, who doesn't, who has money in their account, who doesn't, who plays ball better than the next person. We all know all these things and this our internal. And second of all, this is very human, right? Our ranking of other humans. This is, this is a real thing. Um, so we walk in with that. So when I talk, you may have created a container as a facilitator where this is separate from everything that happens back on the housing units, but we walk in with all of our, our, so if I cut off somebody else who's higher ranked than me, he's going to feel that, or she's going to feel that like, oh no, you just violate it. You think it's cool that you violate in here. Cause you're safe in here with the white people bubble. Are you crazy? Like, um, so you're walking into, you don't, and you have no idea what the ranking is people don't even know what the ranking is it's not even it's not like there's a, a chalkboard with these check marks right. on it uh um or major league baseball stats it's it's all fluid and like weird but it's there um so i guess those are the two main points i've screwed up heavily and learned horribly almost like a fist fights over feeling the container the the facilitator did such a good job i'm improvising i'm in people's face i'm like fuck you blah, 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 blah. and they're like yo who the fuck are you talking to? I'm like, hey, 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 I'm safe in here. And like, they took, they called me out and I, they were like, yo, mom, don't ever talk to me like that. I was like, I was improvising, whatever. Anyway, the ch the, the fact is, is that um, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. There's no way for you to know. There's not enough time for you to get all that information. So even if you're really skilled at creating the container, that this is a very special place and we leave everything outside on the outside and we take time to process and de you can't 
Um, it's the same people who do violence interruption on the outside and they bring together gang leaders from two different gangs and they're there in the room and it's like, oh, we've created a safe space, but it's not, it's not all that shit. They walk out the room and their peeps are waiting for them. Like, where were you? What were you doing? What are you talking? It's not. Um, so I think understanding that people are bring this is not abstract for the people you're working with. It's. And that for every vulnerability that they give to the space, that's a real thing that they're offering. That's a real sacrifice that they're making to the space. It's not, it's not whimsy or light. It is in a deep, deep, deep um, contribution to, and, and, and I think it's pinned on hope personally like if i can find that in myself and i can see that in other people in the room that they're they knowing the circumstances knowing the pecking order knowing the challenges knowing the risks still give to the group that means that we've elevated in our minds collectively the hope for the group itself that this is a thing and personally this is why i still work in arts and corrections i believe that that hope is horribly infectious and has ripples that go way beyond any one classroom. When your students walk out of that classroom and they've done Shakespeare and their their bodies are humming with the, the power of embodying a character and they walk out of the classroom and they walk back to their housing unit, what they're feeling is not, I'm better than everybody else. What they're feeling is, I hope. I'm about to cry because what it's so fucking true that what they're experiencing that experience is, um, it's a gift that they give each other and you as, a, as being present and facilitating it and being in the mix. But it's also, it, you can't, you're just not the same after you embrace hope. Right, I, I think I, I agree with everything you're saying, Robbie. And I also, I also wanna add that it's a ripple effect outside of the facility into the families and the people in which they're in communication with. Um, I know that uh, when I sent pictures of myself in the role of Earth the Disturber on to my family with my face painted and my cowl and my, and my dripping things on my face, they were like, what is going on? And I was like, I'm having an experience and I'm going to share this experience with you. Um, it's totally transformative. Um, but I, I, but I think that when you create the space in the classroom, it, it recognize that it is porous. I mean, I, obviously you can't create like the, like the perfect bubble or whatever, but I think it's meant to be porous because a human being is not a cordoned off, boxed off human being. It's meant to be fluid. And so aspects of who they are on the housing unit or in the personal world or with their children or, or, or with their, their relationships on the housing unit, because that's also a very real world issue, uh, you know, is going to play through all of that. If, for example, people choosing to be characters um, are asking to be characters because they're in relationships with each other. I mean, that's, that's the reality of it. It's fluid to the degree that it is not disruptive to the entire process. It shouldn't matter. Because if I was an actor in the world, I would be bringing who I was at, at my outside world to my act, character I'm acting on the stage in a professional setting to put up before the people. It's, it's a flu, it, it is a completely a fluid relationship. And I think that you shouldn't try to um, make the experience of the classroom just the experience of the classroom. I mean, because it's going to filter in and it's going to filter out. Um, I think that the, 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 what we try to do is like kind of like get centered. Like here we coming in, we're gonna do some work. So in order to do some work, we've got to pause on the cacophony from the housing unit so that we can actually think on the shit that we're trying to do in this classroom right now. And, and whatever little thing that you can, what, what I've seen is to be effective is whatever little thing that we can do where we all go, okay, we're gonna do this stuff. I mean, doesn't mean that I don't know what's on the housing unit or out in the hallway or what's going on. It doesn't mean that some girl's not gonna go to the bathroom so she can meet up with her girlfriend in the hallway. It doesn't mean any of that. It, mean, it means that in this moment, you're saying, let's center and be in here. Let's be here. Let's be present here. 
That was an incredible uh, response to that question. I can't thank you enough for for that perspective. I think it's very important for us to to understand hope is a tool. Hope is a weapon. Yes. Hope as hope as a false promise too. And so to to shoulder mm. that obligation very very seriously and um and and understand that there's a lot of residual effect that can come from our actions within that space, our safe space, as you said, right? Uh, Stefan Wolfert, um, who is the founder of Decruit, which is all about um, working with veterans coming back from combat and PTS and, and the things that they're inhabiting, he says, we can't create a safe space. What we can do is collectively secure the space. Um, and so I've tried to try to keep that mantra in mind. Yeah. Um, we are like three minutes from the end of our time. Oh, um, wow. Kate, I, I, I guess I, I'll, I'll let you close it out here. Yeah. I'm, I, I feel like it's on Robbie and Michelle. Um, this is their show. I'm just so grateful to both of you uh, for making the time to share your experience um, and your perspective and your insight um, and your powerful brains with us. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank um, you guys for being here. I mean, uh, it's been an honor. And I, and I think um, all the things that Rob has brought to the table, I think um, as we integrate, as you guys all integrate this into your work and, and, and some of the thoughts that I brought to the table, I hope that um, it informs your practice um, of what you want to do and create. I mean, we're all, we are always co-creating we are always manifesting. And, and I hope that as you weave this into the dough that you're making and the bread that you're baking, that um, you, you uh, feel empowered as amazing facilitators to create space for, for, I mean, I can think about all the things that I've done in incarceration in 20 years and it blows my mind what we were able to pull off. Like <laughs> some of the things that we've done. And I think that that's just a wonder of, of what's possible when everybody's willing to just kind of keep weaving into that bread and baking that bread and making and making um, bringing our whole selves to the artistic practice and 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 just and just really being grateful for the things that we're able to create together. I mean, I think gratitude is hugely a part of this. Um, I, I look back on my twenty years of incarceration, and yes, there was a lot of darkness but I look at my artistic practice that I did in co-creating with my faculty and with my fellow sisters that those are the things I treasure. I mean, you know, so, I mean, I actually literally have art pieces that I have brought home that are out in my house. You know what I mean? So um, like deep gratitude. And, and that's something that is, can sustain us while we're dealing with the ugly things that come along with the carceral state. Like, like the conditions of confinement under COVID and, and the way in which they treat, treat us, right? So I thank Robbie, I thank Kate and Scott and all of you um, just for you know, bringing your whole, whole selves presence, present to the, the conversation. I feel the same way, Michelle. I'm like wrapping you in a big bubble hug. And Kate, <laughs> and like, there's all of you, I feel like I, I uh, I feel connected with you, even through this weird virtual space. I'm so happy to meet you and see your faces. And I hope we cross paths again. And I hope you feel inspired to keep going and doing and creating and rocking in the world. Um, yeah. Sending beams of love through the computer screen to all of you. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, so everyone. Much. Do you yeah. want to?